Metro, what's good? How we doing? Come on. You guys showed out with the jerseys. I love it. Hey, uh, I'm from the great state of Connecticut. Frozen chosen, baby. I know you guys don't even know that that's a state, but I love it. So I'm from Connecticut, but it's okay because God brought me out of darkness and into marvelous light. He called me into the promised land of Texas. Amen. Amen. And uh, I do get to live in Waco. I actually went to Baylor University for undergrad. So uh, the Lord actually radically transformed my life as a freshman at Baylor. And uh, I heard this thing called the gospel for the first time in my life. And it changed everything. But I also was dating a girl, uh, my high school sweetheart, and uh, she decided to break my heart in the middle of the best year of my life. I go back home for Christmas break, and every single day of that semester, I'm like, I can't wait to go back to Connecticut. I cannot wait to go back to Connecticut. And then I get to Connecticut, and she breaks up with me. And I was like, dang, I can't wait to go back to Baylor. (laughs) This stinks. So uh, that spring semester, the Lord just uh, uses my lowest point of my life up to that point to really draw me near into him. And then I go back for the summer. It's my first summer out of college. And I'm so excited because I'm prayerfully, secretly hoping that we get back together. So I'm like, okay, she's going to reach out to me. She's going to want to say, hey, boo, what's up? Where you been at? You know, and I'm like, well, I've, you know, trying to act cool. I've just, you know, been doing stuff. But, you know, it's cool. I'll listen to you. What's up? (laughs) That text never came. She never reached out. So now I'm sad and lonely and brokenhearted, and uh, I was a fire hydrant technician for the summer. That's just a really fancy word. I I painted fire hydrants. It was really lame. (laughs) It was the lamest job ever. All my friends had like cool internships. They were like doing stuff as engineers and like in corporate, and I'm like, and I had my heart broken. All my friends were busy, and I would go home every single night and just walk straight up into my room. And that's where I revisited my porn addiction. And that's where I continued to fall into sin. Habitual, repeated, hidden, concealed sin. And the reason I start there, the reason I tell you that is because in our brokenness, our brokenness leads us to loneliness. And loneliness leads us to isolation. So tonight, we're looking at the topic of loneliness and isolation. And we're looking at a character named Mephibosheth, one you may never even heard of. You don't even know he's in your Bible, but he is. 2 Samuel chapter 9 is this character of Mephibosheth. And we're looking at three points tonight. And we're going to learn about his story of loneliness and brokenness and isolation. So we're looking at three points Hopeless in fallenness, hiding in barrenness, and hesitant to approach. Hopeless in fallenness, hiding in barrenness, and hesitant to approach. Let's jump into point number one, hopeless in fallenness. If you will, look at 2 Samuel chapter 9, verses 1 through 3 with me. We're going to dive right in. 2 Samuel says this, And and David said, Is there still anyone left of the house of Saul, that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba, and they they called him to David. And the king said to him, Are you Ziba? And he said, I am your servant. And the king said, "Is Is there not still someone of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God to him? Ziba said to the king, there is still a son of Jonathan. He is crippled in his feet. What we need to understand about the context of this passage, if you are an Old Testament scholar, if you've spent any time in 1 Samuel or 2 Samuel, you know that the entire first book of Samuel, Samuel 1, or 1 Samuel, is about the the rise of Saul as the first king of Israel, and it's also about the fall of Saul. At the end of 1 Samuel, you see the death of Saul. And then in the beginning of 2 Samuel, you see the rise of David. David becomes the next king of the nation of Israel. And what is interesting about history and context is usually when there's a new ruler in town, whenever there's a new monarch, he usually gets rid of everybody who's in the old monarchy. 
Anyone who can lay claim to the throne is a threat to his rule and reign. So he's asking, are there any of my enemies still out there? Is there anyone who would come for my throne? Is there anyone who would challenge me or compete with me? I want to know who it is and I want to know their name. And this guy named Ziba comes up and he says, yeah, there actually is a guy. His name is Mephibosheth. He's Jonathan's son and he's crippled in his feet. He's crippled. He's broken. He's damaged. He's fallen. And what we need to know about context of this time, if you were a cripple, around this time in history, you had no value. You could bring nothing to the table. At best, you were a beggar, and at worst, you were an outcast. So everyone around Mephibosheth has been telling him that he is no good, that he's just a cripple, that he's useless, that he can provide nothing of value. And you might be wondering, you might be asking, hey, how did this happen to him? How did he become this way? Was he born this way? Like, what happened? And the answer to that question is actually fascinating. When David takes over, when he conquers Jerusalem and he ushers in a new kingdom, all the people of the house of Saul, they flee. They run away because they know that they're the enemy of the new king. So at this time, Mephibosheth was just a little boy. He was just a young kid. So his nanny scoops him up, picks him up, and is running. And while she's running, she drops him. And because of the actions of someone else, Mephibosheth was broken. And you and I are the same exact way. Because if you look at Genesis 3 with me, if we go all the way back to Genesis 3, there is something called the fall. Adam and Eve's temptation in the Garden of Eden, when they are in perfect unity with God, the triune God, they are tempted by the enemy and Satan. And because they give in to temptation, because the fruit was pleasing to the eyes and desirable for food, they fell. They go outside of God's will. They go outside of God's plan, outside of God's design. And because they do that, sin enters the world. And sin is now passed on to you and to me. And because of Adam and Eve's actions, you and I are broken. Romans 3.23 just tells us, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every single one of us in this room is broken. Now the enemy, man, he's crafty. I kind of like hate that dude. He's really not my friend. He's really just persistent. Like, he just needs a new hobby. Like, he could play pickleball. He could do anything else. And yet, he just likes to lie. That is what his title is. He's the father of lies. And he's really, really persistent, and he's really, really good at his job. You see, the enemy would love to remind us of our brokenness. The enemy would love to remind you and me of our brokenness. He would love to tell us that we are no good, that we're too far gone, that we're too dirty, too broken, not good enough, unlovable that he wants to remind you of your brokenness because if he can remind you of your brokenness, he can lead you to loneliness. And that's what we're going to see in point number two. As we continue the story of Mephibosheth, we're going to see point number two. We're going to find him hiding in barrenness. That because the enemy is able to remind him of his brokenness, it leads him into loneliness. Jump back into verse 4 with me. It says, 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 4 says this, And the king said to him, Where is he? And Ziba said to the king, He is in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, at Lo-Debar. Lo-Debar is a city. That name of that city, Lo-Debar, literally means nothing. It means a place of no good pasture, a place of insignificance, a place of nothing. And I find that fascinating. I find that curious that Mephibosheth has been reminded of his brokenness. And where does he go? He goes to a place of isolation. 
He goes to a place where there's nothing good waiting for him. He goes to a place where there is no life to be found. He goes to a place of nothing. And in his brokenness, he begins to isolate himself. When I was little, like 11, 12, I was in Little League. uh, And I was practicing a ton in my front yard. It was my dream to be in the MLB. Like, that's all I wanted to do. I wanted to be an MLB baseball player. And if I had someone banging on a trash can, maybe I would have made it there. You know, I don't know. Metro, we're good. Come on, we're friends. Okay, uh, Brandon, you might need to get up here, dude. That was bad. Okay. Anyway, so I was practicing in the front yard. I was tossing this ball up, and I was hitting it toward my house, and I accidentally hit it into a window, just shattered the whole thing. Like, I didn't mean to, but it was bad. So this window's broken in front of my house, and I did what any reasonable 11 or 12-year-old would do. I dropped the bat, and I ran. Just took off. Boom. Gone. Wasn't me. And I run all the way to my room, and I hide under my bed. And I'm like... If they don't know it was me, if they don't find me, like maybe this will just go, it'll be okay with me. And I'm like, I, I dropped some goldfish underneath there. There's a piece of gum that I stuck under there. If I, I can ration that out and I can last like three months before my parents even find me, like it'll be okay. And I heard like my parents' footsteps. You know, I don't know if you're like this, but like I could tell the difference between mom and dad's footsteps, you know, and I was like, My mom used the spoon, so I don't know know what kind of house you raised up in, but I was praying for dad. I was like, please. Man, the reason I tell you that, (laughs) the reason I I tell you that story is because we make barrenness our home. We make isolation our home. Is that we are so quick to run to it. We are so quick to be like, that's where I'm going to go for comfort. I'm just going to hide. I'm just going to pretend like it didn't happen. I'm just going to isolate myself from people. And I make barrenness my home. I go to places of insignificance. Right? I remember when I was in the middle of my porn addiction. My porn addiction lasted 10 years. I remember when I was in the middle of it. And I remember feeling the lowest and the loneliest I had ever been. I remember just believing about myself that I was alone in this, that no one else struggled in the way that I did. I remember feeling so dirty and gross and so much shame and so much guilt. And yet I would keep going back to it. I would keep running there. I would keep choosing to live in a place of Nothing, a place of insignificance, a place that offered me no life. And the reason that is, is because I I so desperately desire comfort. I so desperately desire satisfaction. I'm looking to everything to fill the void. I'm looking to find a home where I can be satisfied. But because I'm broken, it leads me to want to go to places where life is not found. It leads me to want to make my home in places where life cannot be found. And that's exactly what the enemy wants for us. This is exactly what the enemy wants for us. He wants us to live in low debar. He wants us to feel insignificant. He wants us to run to places where there is no life to be had. And as I follow Jesus, what I've learned about him what I've learned about the enemy is that if he can't destroy us, he'll distract us. And if he can't distract us, he'll discourage us. That if he can't keep me from God completely, separated for eternity, then he is going to make my days here miserable by distracting me with things that do not satisfy, by discouraging me and reminding me of my brokenness. In reminding me or trying to convince me that I am my brokenness, that I am my sin struggle. And he wants to keep us there. And he wants to keep us low and keep us in a place of insignificance. So what happens now to Mephibosheth? He's reminded of his brokenness. He's made his home in a place of insignificance. Let's jump back into the text. Look at point number three. 
he became hesitant to approach. He became hesitant to approach. 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 6 says this, And Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face and paid homage. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he, and he answered, Behold, I am your servant. So David sends for Mephibosheth. Okay, now you got to put yourself in Mephibosheth's shoes here. If you got a notice in the mail that the President of the United States, if the IRS, if the FBI were looking for you, would that be like a warm, fuzzy feeling of like, oh, great, tea party? <laughs> no, you and me be like, we packing our bags, we're crossing the border, like, we out of here, we gone. So put yourself in Mephibosheth's shoes. He is the enemy of the king. And he gets a notice that the king has sent for him. And I can't imagine all the things that are going inside of his mind, but he must be thinking, this guy probably wants to kill me or imprison me. Like, this is not going to be a good combo. He's not going to be asking me, how's your soul doing? He's not going to be asking, what are you learning about Jesus? Like, he's like going to kill me. Some people, as they interpret this passage, they think that he falls on his face to pay honor and out of reverence, out of respect. And I genuinely believe that it's out of fear, that he is genuinely terrified because he has no idea what this guy's about to say or to do. I remember the first time I ever confessed sin in a group of like guys in like confessional community, in life group, community group, small group, I don't know what you guys call it. I remember the first time I did that. And I was death gripping my chair. Like, there, like the, the fuzzy stuff inside of it was coming out. Like I was like, and I was like sweating. And I was nervous. And all of these thoughts were racing in my head. And I was like, what are they going to think about me? Are they going to reject me? Are they going to want to be my friend anymore? Are they going to think I'm gross for thinking that or doing that or saying that? I was absolutely terrified. When I was hiding under my bed after I broke the window, my parents did come up and they found me. And my dad was actually the one who came up and he, he got down on his knees and he looked underneath the bed. And all this while, I, I thought my dad was going to be like, what's the matter with you? Why did you do that? How could you? And I just remember he, he knelt down, looked at me and said, Miles, what are you doing? Why didn't you come to me? I would have only wanted the help. And you see, the enemy wants you to think that God is a tyrant to be feared, when in reality, he is a father to run to. The enemy would love for you to be hesitant to approach your father. The enemy would love for you in your loneliness and in your isolation to stay there and to not run to him, not run to the one who can help you, not run to the one who can heal you. The enemy is so crafty in that. Because he knows that if he can get us in a place where we are hesitant to share, he can keep us there. If he can get us in a place where we are hesitant to share, he can keep us right there where he wants us. Right in the place of insignificance, right in the place of loneliness, right in the place of isolation, the furthest from healing we possibly can be. And you see what I've had to learn about community, about confession, is that confession is the first step toward healing. That confession is the first step toward healing. That not trying to do it on my own, not trying to white knuckle, not trying to create a story and justify my sin and be like, no, it's really not that bad. Like, no, it was the last time, so I don't need to confess, so I won't do it again, and it'll, it'll be okay. No, like, confession is the first step toward healing. You see, a sign of spiritual maturity is not... A sign of spiritual maturity is not having no sin to confess. A sign of, of spiritual maturity 
is in how quickly we go to confess. A sign of spiritual maturity is in how quickly I run to go confess, how quickly I run to my dad, how quickly I run to my father because I want to be healed. Not in my cover-up, not in my pretending that I have no problems or that I'm perfect because I'm not. A sign of spiritual maturity is in how quickly we run to confession, how quickly we repent from our brokenness and go to the Father. So we see from Mephibosheth that he was hopeless in fallenness, that he was hiding in barrenness and that he was hesitant to approach, just like you and me. But here's the deal. That's not the end of the story. I actually have three bonus points for you because we're going to go back through this section of Scripture and we're actually going to be looking at the perspective of David. We're going to read this text through the lens of David and we're going to see the Father's heart and the Father's pursuit for you and for me. For those who are broken, for those who are lost, for those who are lonely, for those who are isolated, we are going to look at this story one more time but through the lens of David. So we have three more points. Where Mephibosheth does those things, David does these things. He initiates despite unloveliness. He invites into relationship. And he identifies as new. Let's look at that first point. David initiates despite unloveliness. Jump back to verse 1 with me. 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 1, it says, Is there still anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? That Hebrew word kindness is the Hebrew word hesed. Hesed means a deep covenantal love, a steadfastness. David wants to show a deep commitment. David wants to show love and compassion. He wants to be steadfast and unwavering in his love and compassion to Mephibosheth. David initiates this relationship. David's the one who makes it happen. He's the one who brings it up. He's the one that says, hey, we're not just going to be enemies. That's not going to be how this thing goes. I want to know you. Which is crazy because uh, Mephibosheth wasn't worthy to be loved by the king. He wasn't the type of person who should have been in relationship with the king, and yet David chose to love Mephibosheth. When I was in high school, my dad uh, would ask me to do yard work a lot. But he would always frame it like this. He's like, hey, we're going to do yard work. And then he would go inside, and I would just be stuck doing yard work for the entire afternoon, which doesn't make any sense, so whatever. But he asked me one time, he was like, hey, Miles, I want you to do some yard work. I want you to plant these three trees, okay? So just put one here, one here, and one here. And I was like, got it. I got you. Uh, The first tree was crooked. The second tree, I don't know if it even went in the ground. And the third tree, I just gave up. I just literally sat in the hole, and I was like, this is dumb. Like, I, I quit. I'm not a gardener. I do not have a green thumb. And I literally was in that third hole, and I had just, like, given up. I'm a mess. There's dirt all over me. I didn't even finish the job. And I remember my dad coming out, leaving the back door of our house, walking straight up to me. I'll never forget what he said. He, he looked at me, and he said, Miles, I love you. I'm proud of you. And I'll finish it. And I was like, What? I was like, you, you love me? I'm a mess. You're proud of me. I cheated. I didn't even do the job. I failed. And you're going to finish it? Like, I, I think I'm supposed to do it. And in that moment, I was just reminded of Romans 5, 8, that just says, but God demonstrates his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That when I was at my worst, when I wanted nothing to do with God, when I had been in complete and total rejection and rebellion of him, that's when he chose me. 
that's when he decided, yep, he's mine. Yep, I'm going to go on a rescue mission for him. I'm going to send my son to die for him. Yep. Not when I was clean. Not when I was perfect. Not when I had it figured out. Not when I was a member of a church. Not when I was this much months free from porn. Not when I had this much scripture memorized or stored up in my heart. No, when I was at my worst day, when I was furthest from the Lord. That's when he initiated relationship with me. That's when he said mine and chose me. You see, God does not delight in our brokenness, but in our brokenness, he delights in us. God does not delight in your brokenness. He is not excited that you have to feel anxiety or shame, that you have an addiction, that you struggle with alcoholism, that you struggle with people-pleasing or performance. He does not delight in that. That does not bring him joy. But in your hurting and in your wandering, And in your rebellion, his heart longs for you. And he desires you. You see, where Mephibosheth saw brokenness, God saw belovedness. Where the enemy wanted to tell Mephibosheth that you are no good and you are nothing. God wanted to remind him that he was everything and that he was worth dying for. So David initiates despite unloveliness. Our God initiates despite our unloveliness. And David also invited into relationship. He invites Mephibosheth into relationship. Look at 2 Samuel 9, verses 5 through 7. It says, then King David sent and brought him from the house of Machir, the son of Amiel at Lodabar. And Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face and paid homage. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, behold, I am your servant. And David said to him, do not fear, for I will show you kindness, Hesed. For the sake of your father, Jonathan, and I will restore to you all the land of Saul, your father, and you shall eat at my table always. And you shall eat at my table always. What a crazy invitation. Have you ever received an invitation that you like regretted that you didn't accept or go to? Like, it's fun receiving invitations. Like, one, I'm like, oh, you think we're friends? Cool. <laughs> like, I, I thought we were friends, but now that you invited me, like, and I seals it, and I'm like, that's awesome. One time, my wife, last year, invited me to go to the Final Four to see UConn. And I said no. And I was like, ah, oh, gosh, why did I do that? Stupid, stupid, stupid. I'm still kicking myself for that one. But there is an invitation here. David invites Mephibosheth to eat at his table, to be friends with him, to sit with the king. And there is an invitation into relationship with Jesus that is for us, that is waiting for us, that we don't have to work for, we don't have to earn, it is just there. We just get to receive. He is inviting us into relationship with him. You see, Mephibosheth went from a place of nothing to a palace of fullness. He went from a place of nothing to a palace of fullness. He had the best food, the best stuff, the best clothes, all because he knew the king. Because he lived in the palace. And that's the type of life that Jesus wants to offer us, a life of fullness, a life to the full. John 10 says, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I came so that you could have life and life to the full, life abundant. That's the type of life that Jesus wants to offer us, that he's inviting us into, is a full life. Psalm 1611 says, You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Psalm 1079 says, For he satisfies the longing soul, and the hungry soul he fills with good things. There is a life waiting for you with Jesus that will lead to true satisfaction and joy that you cannot find anywhere else. It is not possible to be found anywhere else outside of the will of God. You cannot find life. 
But the craziest part about this story, in my eyes, is that we have to remember that Mephibosheth was lame. He was crippled in his feet. So how did he get to the table? Did he run there? Did he walk there? Did he crawl there? No, 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 no. Look at the, look at the verse. Look at the passage. What does it say? It says, then, then King David sent and brought him. That David brought him. I just picture it this way, right? I see Mephibosheth coming into the door. David seeing him and said, yes. It's Mephibosheth, and he runs to him, and he scoops him up, and he picks him up and brings him to the table and says, this is yours now. Everything here is yours. You don't need to go anywhere anymore. You don't need to go to Lodabar. You don't need to go to the place of insignificance. You don't need to chase that thing anymore. You don't need to go to that ex. You don't need to go to that toxic relationship. Stop going to the bars. It's right here. It's me. And I'll show you the life to fullness. I'll show you a way where you can have true satisfaction and joy, the hope you're looking for, the peace you're looking for, the satisfaction you're looking for. It's right here. It's with me. Don't go anywhere else. Let me show you. Follow me. You see, you and I are just like Mephibosheth. And we need to be carried to the table. We need to be carried into deeper relationship with our king. Some of us in this room need to stop striving and start abiding. Some of us in this room need to stop going outside of God's will or design to try and find life. It's not there. Some of us need to let ourselves be loved by our Heavenly Father for the first time. He is inviting us into relationship. Let's look at the last point. David identified him as new. David identified Mephibosheth as new. 2 Samuel 9, verses 7 and 11, it says this, And David said to him, Fear not. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. He ate always at the king's table. He ate at the table like one of David's sons. You see, God could have just saved us. He could have just justified us, but he doesn't just stop there. He also adopts us. He doesn't just say, you are righteous now. Because of Jesus' work, he says, no, you're my son and my daughter. He says, you get to experience the fullness of being adopted into the family of God. You get to be with me forever. You are new. And what's crazy about this, it says for the phrase pops up a couple times, David shows him this kindness. He loves him this much. He's committed to him in this way because of the sake of your father, Jonathan. For the sake of your father, Jonathan, David made a covenant with, da- with, David made a covenant with Jonathan. And he said, I will be committed to your family and to your sons for all time. I'm committed to them. So when David looks upon Mephibosheth, he sees Jonathan. When God looks at you and me, he sees Christ. He no longer sees your brokenness. He no longer sees your sinfulness. He sees Christ's work. He sees Christ's righteousness that's covering you. 2 Corinthians 5.17 just says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Friends, the cross carries our old self. We don't need to carry it anymore. It's not ours. It's not who we are. He's identified us as new. So in summary, Because we are hopeless in fallenness, hiding in barrenness, 
and hesitant to approach. God initiates despite unloveliness, invites into relationship, and identifies as new. My favorite thing to do with my dad growing up, like whenever we would travel, go on vacation, go on family trips, whatever it was, it didn't matter. We could have been shopping in the grocery store. But the one thing I would always want him to do is to put me on his shoulders. I just wanted to be tall like my dad. I wanted to be up there and see what he could see. I just wanted to, uh, to be with my dad and I wanted him to hold me. Now, I'm not going to lie, I'm a little bit afraid of heights. So being up there was kind of scary. And there would be times where I would like have my fingers in his mouth because I was holding on to dear life and I would like choke him out and I'd be like, don't you dare let me go, bro. Like if I fall, this ain't going to be fun. And there would be times where I would let go. There would be times where I think I was falling. There would be times where I was like, oh no, this is, this is it. And there was never not a time that when I let go, my dad wasn't holding on to me. There was never a time in the entire time me doing that, when I was on my dad's shoulders, when I would let go, when I would think I was falling, that I didn't have the security of my dad holding on to me. He was always right there. He would never forsake me. He would never leave me. He always was holding on. He always had me. Lamentations 3, 23, just says, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Metro, we serve a God who is great in faithfulness that when you and I are unfaithful, he never ceases to be faithful. When you and I reject him or leave him, he does not cease to pursue us. He does not stop running after us, calling us, wanting us to come back to him. The love of our God, the pursuit of our God is great and greatly to be praised. Let's pray. I just want you to take 30 to 60 seconds. Just right now in the quietness of your own heart. For you to go to God. To go to God. And do some business. With the Heavenly Father who loves you. I just want you to remind yourself right now of His great faithfulness. Of His enduring love for you of his steadfast pursuit of you. Remind yourself right now of what he's saved you from, of what pit he pulled you out of. Remind yourself right now that even in your present brokenness, he delights in you and loves you and wants to lead you to life. Jesus, thank you for loving us and choosing us. Thank you for not leaving us 
in brokenness and in bondage. Thank you for going on the world's greatest rescue mission to save and redeem that which was lost. Father, would our hearts rest tonight in having found a home in you and being satisfied in a relationship with you. We just want to remind ourselves one last time tonight that you are true satisfaction and joy. There's nothing better than you and there's no one beyond you. Amen.